Oh, my hope as I minister the word of God is that his Holy Spirit, who actually lives in you as a believer, will somehow take my feeble sharing and make it an encouragement or a blessing in your life. Uh, I'm not trusting myself or trusting my 57 years of walking with Jesus, but I'm trusting him to do a work of uh, grace in our hearts. I'm going to look at a number of uh, scriptures, starting with Psalm 67. We're living in a day when there's a lot of misunderstanding about global missions. So many people today in the church have never been to a missionary meeting, never heard a missionary. Uh, we have churches that actually boast that they don't send missionaries. So we live in days of great complexity. I deal with some of those controversies uh, in my book. You can get other books, by the way, free of charge if you just go into my website, georgeverward.com. Don't get sidetracked into too many of my blogs, especially this blog of me doing the exercise program in a jumbo jet toilet. This is really not my main focus. That, uh, I don't know why I did that, actually, but it's there. But um, I don't think I fit into the shoes of a traditional missionary speaker, though I highly honor them because uh, my main message is just the, the Lord Jesus and the Holy Spirit working in God's people. And I want to encourage you in your ministry here as much as I'd like to encourage you also to be involved in other nations. It's not getting any easier to share your faith here in Great Britain, where I've now lived for 50 years. There's a lot of resistance. There's a lot of prejudice. I just spoke at Liberty University to 10,000 students. And then someone sent me a, a New York Times article uh, attacking Liberty University because of something the, the founder, who's died, said years ago in the trauma of September 11th. He did say something completely stupid. He apologized for that. That's almost 10 years ago. He's in heaven. The university doesn't stand. That's not what they're about at this university. And yet this famous New York Times, uh, quoting someone else, you know, makes that university look like they're just really, you know, a bunch of weirdos. Actually, that university has changed a lot. It's much more open. It's got all kinds of people there. It gives an excellent degree, high academics, great sports. They're just ordinary people in many ways who love Jesus. But there's this bias. Uh, the Pentecostal church has had the brunt of it in many parts of the world through media, through television. Maybe you don't watch film. But you know this, this film, The Pledge, with a top actor in the end of the film, the serial killer. He was, uh, he was a, sort of a wild pastor. And today we have a whole generation of people who don't read much. They get a lot of it all from the cinema. So we're living, we're living especially in Europe, but Turkey would even be worse. The, president, the pre prejudice against Christians in Turkey is just off the charts. And, uh, you know, what people believe uh, affects their behavior. Hindus in certain parts of India have read such horrendous things about Muslims, they feel it is justified to murder Muslims. And so not long ago, a whole bunch of Muslims just all got slaughtered. And I read some of the material that's being used to stir up hatred between Hindus and Muslims. It really is, it really is off the charts. So we are in a mission field, surrounded by people from all over the world. And one of the keys, and this is the bottom line of my message tonight, is to stay encouraged and to be optimistic. Now, it's not easy for me to say that because I have a really strong negative streak and pretty well battle discouragement pretty well every day because I just so easily see the dark side. I have this fear I'm going to become like the Darth Vader of the evangelical world. And uh, I don't want that. And God met me in a powerful way in, in concerning my negative streak once when I was in Pakistan. And I had a very key meeting. Our work was just starting there. I was hesitant to start in Pakistan because we're so involved in India and those two countries are at odds. But the work finally started partly through a ship visit there. And I was speaking at a very key meeting and heard that one of the main church leaders, actually the bishop of the Church of North India, North Pakistan in this case, 
was in the meeting. So an OM leader came to me and said, look, could you be careful what you say? I'm known for saying at least two or three completely stupid things per sermon. I'm trying to cut down on that. And so he said, could you be careful what you say? And then another, uh, I said, okay, you know, I'll do my best. He got me uptight a bit. Then another leader came to me and he said, look, do you think tomorrow you could dress properly uh, for the meeting? It's going to be in the cathedral. This is before I had my global jacket. This sort of covers everything. But I, I never hardly bought any clothes. I just got it out of the missionary barrel. Often it didn't fit and I didn't even care. So I wasn't really the best dressed missionary in Pakistan. Anyway, here I am the next day. I've got a suit and a tie on. I look like an undertaker. I'm really trying my best. And guess what? Oh, negative thing. Do any of you struggle with negative uh, thoughts? Or am I the only one? Yeah, there's a few of us in this uh, negative thought tendency club. So as I'm speaking, try my best. Guess what? A pigeon flies over me, <laughs> drops its load on the sleeve of my suit in front of the bishop. Huh? Negative thinker's typical, isn't it? But you know, God had a new plan for me. And I just looked at these people and I said, let's praise the Lord that the elephants don't fly around here. <laughs> really. I've never been the same. I am optimistic because God is God. Because there is a sovereign plan that we can never fully understand. I'm optimistic about Great Britain, my adopted country. My wife is now British. We both applied, she got accepted, and I got rejected. That's, <laughs> that's always good for the soul. I think they found out I had a record with the Soviets for Bible smuggling in 1960. No, actually it's because I wasn't in the country enough on the final year that I applied. But God is working here in Britain. We have thousands and thousands of new churches. There's a much greater knowledge of the Holy Spirit than we had, say, 50 years ago when I arrived here. Of course, you can always see the dark side. All of history, the majority of people have not come to Christ. That's predicted in the Word of God. Narrow is the way. Few there be that find it. So I don't know why we're always surprised by that. We at the same time are human. We find it hard to meet so many people who are outside of Christ. Our prisons are full. We read the percentages of uh, drug addicts. We read the percentage of people in, involved in binge drinking. I mean, it is, it is depressing, isn't it? But we must, by faith, focus more on God himself and what he is doing. Yes. His ways are different from ours. Yes. He's not trying to win an election. Yeah. <laughs> it's not a popularity contest. Yeah. Is Jesus more popular than whoever else? Our living God is drawing people unto himself through the proclamation of his word and we'll never fully understand it until someday. And the Bible says that in a number of passages until someday we're with him. And so I'm hoping tonight can be an encouraging night for you to keep on keeping on. I'm sure many of you are being used of God probably more than you rate yourself. Uh, my experience with British people, maybe you're, you know, different but they do tend to put themselves down and they, they're quick to tell you uh, about, uh, they don't feel they're spiritual enough or we, we, we have these different heroes and we read their books and somehow we think they're up here and you know we're down here struggling with basic things just trying to get through life. I am partly here and I've run the race every day since my conversion because Especially that first year when I was director of OM and director of the first ship, living on board was a very difficult year. Before that, I was always preaching about all the different aspects of discipleship. But after that year, especially thanks to a couple of powerful books, I started a whole new message, especially for myself, survivalship. <laughs> I realized some days I probably wasn't going to accomplish great things. Maybe I wouldn't even preach on that day. Maybe I wouldn't win anybody to Jesus on that day. On that day, maybe I would just survive. I'd just get through the day without doing something stupid or without getting just wiped out through some fiery dart. For the Bible is very clear, especially in Ephesians chapter 6, about the spiritual warfare and the fiery darts and holding the shield of faith. And so survivalship now comes together uh, with survivalship. That's why I like Ronald Dunn's book, When Heaven is Silent, because a lot of my prayers so far have never been answered for Iraq, for Afghanistan, for Turkey, other nations that I've been involved with my whole life we've not seen 
the breakthrough. And uh, this man prayed and prayed for his son and his son committed suicide. That really wasn't an answer to prayer. And so he had the courage to write when heaven is silent. It's interesting that Pete Gregg, the founder of the 24-7 prayer movement, I was just with him, that his latest book is When God is on Mute. And so if you feel like some of your own prayers haven't been answered, let me just tell you, that's a big club. That's a big organization. Pretty well every man or woman of God that has ever lived has had to battle that challenge and the mystery of it. And I hope that somehow the Lord will give you grace for whatever you're facing in your own life. Psalm 67, we call it the global prayer of the nation psalm. May God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face shine on us. He does want to bless you tonight. I just get so encouraged being with God's people. Just looking at you and realizing probably in most cases you know Jesus. The majority of people I look at traveling through uh, the London Underground, which is almost <laughs> like my life. At least I go free now. As a senior, I have a pass for the whole of Greater London. And I just see so many people. I've just been in Kuala Lumpur, just been in Bangkok. I've just been in 10 cities of India. Multitudes and multitudes. You can see the lostness on their faces as they, be, as they prepare to topple into eternity. So I am highly appreciative of every believer. One of the first persons I met when I came in, uh, and they said he was a, a new believer. Lucky I almost jumped out of my shoes. I love new believers. And we should just gather around them because that first year is often very tough. You get to meet some rather strange Christians. <laughs> yeah. You know, wouldn't it be nice if all Christians behaved properly? And none of them were like weird, like, hey, me. <laughs> well, I hope that's not true in any negative sense. So God wants to bless us. And that's what this psalm says. Bless us. Make your face shine on us. But this is for a purpose. This isn't just so we feel good and we know we're saved and we're happy so that your ways may be known on earth. That's why I wear this jacket. The whole world. Your ways may be known on earth. Your salvation among all nations. I noticed the jacket doesn't make the impact it used to when I first started wearing it. I had to, uh, to really get an impact some time ago. I had to show them uh, my global underwear. Then things really took, <laughs> things really took off. My wife did not appreciate that, and so that does not happen anymore. In fact, I can't, I can't find them. I think she's hidden them. So your maze may be known on earth, your salvation among all nations. May the people praise you, God. May all the people praise you. May the nations be glad and sing for joy. For you rule the people with equity. And guide the nations of the earth. May the people praise you, God. May all the people praise you. The lands yield its harvest. God, our God, blesses us. May God bless us still. So all the ends of the earth will fear him. So I hope you're willing, by faith, to receive something from the Lord tonight. Maybe it's going to be in one of the books. Maybe it'll be in one verse that I quote. Or maybe my testimony. Or maybe some other way through the song, the worship we have. Turn now to Matthew chapter 9. I'm so glad you didn't uh, tell me how long I could speak. I always uh, appreciate that. I'm known as the longest speaker in the whole of Europe. That's why many people never invite me. But obviously you hadn't heard that. But I remember once I was in Germany. I love Germany. It's one of my favorite countries. It's in my top 50 nations list. And... I was there in Germany. I was going on a bit long, and the young people were really listening, so I felt free. It was an OM. We organized the meeting, so I felt free. But one older man in the back, I think he felt I was going too long. Germans are very punctual. I was talking about missions, the need to pray, the need to go, the need to give. And so he took his watch off, and uh, he just started, started uh, waving his watch at me, trying to get me to stop. And, when I saw the watch, I stopped the meeting. I said, folks, look at this. God's touched this man's heart. He's donating his watch to World Missions. <laughs> I forget, actually, what happened after that. But our next scripture is Matthew chapter 9, where we have this beautiful picture of Jesus. Jesus going out to all the towns and villages. Jesus was a person of action. Jesus was on the move. Christian pacifism came in through a couple of books and certain preachers years ago 
where people who were not in the action still felt quite comfortable in their spirituality. They weren't reaching anybody with the gospel. They spent a lot of time at home basically watching television and sometimes reading their Bible. And they, of course, went to church and enjoyed church. And sort of a pacifism came. And then another message came that gave everybody fear that they get in the flesh. Sort of a super spiritual kind of message where you just felt, you know, unless the Holy Spirit sort of lifted me up and carried me, I might just get into the flesh. And so I met people who were just waiting to be carried. One of the men who led this actually became a Mormon. After going through one of our famous Bible schools, became a devout, committed Mormon. Two Bible schools he went through. So, um, you know, I don't believe that Christians can be obedient to Jesus and not be active. And regardless of their age, this idea that we're going to retirement, are going to retire and sort of do our thing in the final years of our life, which could be 20 or 30 years. People are living so long. I have friends who are 100. I love to fellowship with my 100-year-old friends. I come out feeling really young. <laughs> not easy when you're on the ship surrounded by teeny boppers. But uh, we see the Lord Jesus was a person of action. We are to be conformed to his image. That's not just in the sort of spiritual sense of having more love and grace, all of which is important, but we are to be people of action. So here we see Jesus, verse 35 of chapter 9, going out to all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and every sickness. Now, if we just had that one verse, we might be able to wangle out of that. Say, well, that's just Jesus who does that. But the whole book of Acts is filled with verses like this in almost every chapter. I'd love to send you a set of my CDs on the book of Acts, uh, 11 messages from the book of Acts, or if you prefer DVDs, three of us in the cathedral, Richard Buse and a theologian, Paul Blackham and myself, did a series on Acts that's gone out on television. Be happy to Send it to you as a gift. You just have to email me. And this has been a model for me all of my life, from my, almost the moment of my conversion, to just start reaching out. First, it was my own hometown. Started going door to door with books. Started showing films. Of course, it was my own high school. I was saved just before my final year of high school and before going to college. We started prayer groups. I got, uh, got the headmaster to give me permission to distribute Gospels through the whole high school. A thousand people started to read these Gospels. No wonder six months later when I came back, we had a meeting and hundreds came to my high school auditorium. And when I gave the invitation to repent and believe on Jesus, 125 stood, including my own father, the son of an atheist, to believe on Jesus. So even as young believers, God can use us as we step out by faith, following the example of the Lord Jesus in the power of his Holy Spirit. But then we have verse 36, which takes us a little deeper into motivation. And God is concerned about our motivation. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Many times I've had to repent because I see the crowds and I find sometimes my heart is hardened. Um, I find other things grabbing my attention. No matter how filled we are with the Holy Spirit, we're incredibly human. And things can grab our attention, not necessarily things that are wrong. But I found so often I had to repent of the lack of love, lack of love for lost people. One of the reasons I love this street pastors movement with all of its complexity is because it's showing the love of Jesus. They don't always get a chance to share the gospel. Sometimes they do. But they're out there late at night helping these drunks, helping these drug addicts, helping abused people. Even the police are paying tribute to the street pastors movement, which is spread across Great Britain like lightning. Jesus was moved with compassion. As we hear about the nations, as we think, see, and we're overexposed now to news, let our hearts be broken. Let us be moved with compassion. And often during the day when things hit us to somehow try to stop and find a little oasis where we can pray and put it in the hands of the Lord because we can't carry it. I can't carry this crisis in Syria. We're involved in Syria. It's just, just overwhelming. It's a catch-22. It's just 
No matter what way I think through it, I see no hope for Syria, uh, at least in the next 10 years. What are we going to say about the crisis, ongoing crisis in Libya? All the Libyan believers could sit in the first row of this church, and we have 50 years. We've had people in prison there. Scriptures are going in there right now. There are people in there sharing their faith. But, I mean, we just have such a long way to go. One of my favorite verses, I must confess, 1 Peter 5, 7, casting every care upon him because he cares for you. If we're a normal group of human beings, all of us here have some cares. My wife and I do. We have children. We have grandchildren. We have cares. Casting every, all your cares upon him. It's, it's so basic. And yet a lot of people are not doing it. They're worried about their finance. They're worried about the future. They're worried about their kids. Worried about their grandkids. Worried about their health. There's 50 things you can worry about. What will it accomplish? Casting every care upon him. I had a crisis experience with God driving the first lorry in the summer of 62 to the coast. And I was leading this campaign. It was only 200 people. It was only 12 vehicles, but it was a huge thing for me. It had never been done before. Criticism was already coming at us. And especially, why are you buying these old vehicles? Why don't you buy brand new vehicles? Well, we're lucky we had the money to, you know, even put food on the table. So we bought these old vehicles just before they hit the London scrapyards. And we had some mechanics. We had the goal of distributing 25 million pieces of literature that summer. I mean, it was off the charts, and I was uptight driving to Dover. I remember driving over one of the bridges coming out of, um, we were over there in Dalston, 30 Middleton Road, Dalston. We had a little bomb place that had, a bomb had been there. We parked our vehicles and tried to get them repaired. I mean, this was a Holy Ghost gypsy operation. And this, as we drove over one of the bridges, Tremendous noise started coming from the engine. I thought, we'll never, we'll never get to Dover, much less to Paris. And somehow that, that word from Hebrews 4 about the rest of faith came to my mind. There must be some other way of just resting in the Lord. And um, I don't remember the details. That's a long time ago. It's almost 50 years this summer. But I remember just the Holy Spirit bringing peace and joy, and somehow this, God, this is your work. This isn't mine. I'm finished. Take over. And then we pulled into a little garage, and the guy fixed the car in about five minutes, the truck. It was some little thing, and uh, we missed the ferry and ended up driving through Belgium to get to Paris. And I still can't believe how that, that summer took place. I was one of the older ones. You know, I was like 23, married with just one son. My next son was to be born in a London smog a few months after that. God's mercy, God's grace, moved with passion, moved with compassion, trusting him, casting every care upon him. And then look what it says. The harvest is plentiful, the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into the harvest fields. And what am I pleased tonight? Isn't firstly for you to go? The Holy Spirit has to do that in his way. One of the reasons I don't get invited to churches is they're afraid someone will leave the church and go to the mission field. And, you know, what, what are we going to do with our church if, like, a key person goes? Now, some churches, way back, uh, if they had problem cases that they didn't really want around the church, they'd encourage them. Uh, to join Operation Mobilization. That's the truth. One of my favorite churches was Pip and Jay with Malcolm Whittacom, great Pentecostal Anglican church in Bristol. He's gone to heaven. But I talked to him once about this guy that, they, that came from there on OM. He really was not able to do this kind of work. I loved him, but he, his social skills, his just in general, he was not functioning. And so I talked to Malcolm about him. He said, well, look, you know, we just felt we couldn't do anything with him here. <laughs> so we wanted to give you a chance. The beautiful thing is when we've had people come and we could tell hundreds of stories, they weren't very equipped. They had struggles in the Christian life. They didn't have a, right, a high ra rating in their home local church. It's hard to be sometimes a good testimony in your hometown. I think Jesus had a little problem in that area. 
And after two years on OM, they return to the church a transformed person. And that's how OM's reputation has increased and increased and increased almost every year in the UK. The credibility got greater because of the lives of the people who came and returned, transformed. Of course, there are exceptions. And so please keep praying for workers to go into the harvest, short term, long term. But we need to realize as we look at the world in which we live, the situation has greatly changed. And uh, many of the workers shouldn't be going to the same places. If the church now is huge in that country like Kenya, Brazil, uh, South Korea, you know, I can name dozens of other countries where the church is larger and more robust than even the UK, though they often have great difficulty sending out any missionaries. It's a long road between massive church growth like we have in Mexico and sending out missionaries from Mexico. For 50 years, I basically watched it fail. And Mexico was our first field. Because missions isn't just a matter of praying and saying, God bless you, and then a young person volunteering. Where does the money come from? Where is the prayer support? And so many, many young people who've wanted to go into missions from these new sending countries, and we're very involved in those countries, it's never happened. Quite a few were able to go short term. They got their uncle to sponsor them. They had some money in the bank. But, you know, once you're married and you have one or two children, to see a church in a place like Brazil or Mexico or other countries of that kind send you out as a career missionary, it's just not happening to the degree that we're hoping and dreaming these 40 years of being involved in global mobilization. Great Britain is still in the top 10 nations in the world in terms of potential for world missions because of the legacy in the church, the understanding of missions, the finance that's in the church and often available to send out people short and long term into missions. Let us never think that when it comes to global missions, because we're facing so many crises here, we can't really be involved that much overseas. It's got to be both. If we're going to be biblical, it has to be both. I actually encourage churches to give a huge amount of all their time and energy to their own church. Make sure they're growing. Make sure the people are encouraged and growing in Christ because Satan attacks the local church in order to cut the missions thing off altogether. That's happened in quite a few churches, both in the United States, Canada, here, and other nations. I partly share this passage because when I share this passage, I get launched in to share my story of how I came to Jesus. I'm not from a really Christian home. My grandfather from the Netherlands, a little country over here. Where's it gone? It's under my armpit now. Uh, uh, he was an atheist. My father and my grandfather came with the family to the New York City area. My other grandfather was Scottish, Irish, and English combined. Huh? That's basically toxic. He was a complete drunk. My grandmother divorced him. I only met him a couple times. The final time he was dying of alcoholism an addicted man in a hospital near my home. So I didn't have much of a spiritual legacy. When a woman who believed the word of God, when a woman who believed that God answered prayer, who had read this passage, began to pray for me. She put me, my name on her Holy Ghost hit list. And she began to pray for me. Not only that I would become a Christian, she prayed that I'd become a missionary. She prayed that God would send me out as a missionary, you know, maybe she didn't want me around her town. So, you know, send him out. And, you know, if you want to live your own selfish life, whatever you do, avoid these women of prayer. You know, even in the church, don't sit near one of them. Sit, you know, sit somewhere else. Or, but if a woman of prayer gets your name, you know, get ready. She got my name. I'm not sure to this day how she got it. I, the police had caught me in some housebreaking thing, and I had some trouble when I lit the entire woods on fire, and the fire department had to come out to take care of that, and a few other crazy things were happening. And so I think through her son, a godly man who was a senior when I was in my first year, she got my name and started to pray. And then she put action into her prayer by sending me a Gospel of John uh, through the post. And as I read this little Gospel of John, and I believe all of us as Christians 
should be distributing Christian literature. But as I read this Gospel of John, God began to move in my heart. By that time, I'd started in a small way to move into the world of pornography. Uh, already, my life, romance was the biggest thing. One girlfriend after another, starting age 12. I just got totally blown away by different girls. About 30 some different girls had blown all my romantic circuits before I was 17. You know, New York City is a very fast lane culture, even in those days. We didn't just jump in bed and have sex so much like it is today, but it was, it was, it was almost addictive. And this woman kept praying for me, and in some ways I got worse. And then a spiritual tornado blew in New York City. It's called the Billy Graham Tornado. An evangelist, one night, March 3rd, 1955, that's going to really date me. And somehow, because a Christian business person gave a free seat on a coach, because of the prayers of this woman and others had joined in praying for me, I went to that meeting. And I heard the gospel. Maybe you're new here tonight. The gospel. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And that night, I responded to that message. I was born again. I was listening to that on audio uh, this morning. John chapter 3, the story of Nicodemus. I was born again. Uh, I won't go into detail, but I just give you my testimony. Every single day, I've never missed a day. Every single day since that night, I've known the grace and the power of Jesus and have served him. It all comes together. This idea we have to wait some years before we serve him is a misconception. Of course we serve him in weakness. Ten years later we also serve him in weakness. I'm still serving him in weakness. His grace is sufficient. His strength is made perfect in weakness. And one of the persons that often has the greatest ability to win people to Jesus is someone who's just saved. They still have their old friends. You know, they have to play it really carefully. And you lose some and you win some and you might get totally rejected. But often when you're first saved, you have the opportunity of bringing others to Jesus and introducing them to your new friends. I'm not saying it's easy, but in my life, the first couple of years of my Christian life, God was doing incredible things, incredible things. So before I was 21, I understood how to deal with temptation I brought this struggle with pornography into, into grips and reality. I learned about prayer. I learned about sharing my faith. I learned about, I got the vision for literature, selling books door to door all over my area. That's how I got some of the first money for the first trip to Mexico. I was in Mexico, 6,000 kilometers away, by 19 years of age, learning a foreign language, helping the Mexican believers with bringing reality and revival in their churches. And I'm reminded of that passage. Let no man despise your youth. So no matter how young you are here, or no matter how old, God wants to use you. I know he already is using you, but he wants to use you more. I have 100,000 people who follow me in prayer. I have, I have pressure on me not to take meetings like this. I just got back. I'm jet lagged. I haven't seen my wife much, but I managed to, get all those things in. I had time with my wife. I took my daughter to lunch and the grandson who was up all night so he fell asleep even eating his steak. And then I made a quick dash to the station and got a really fast taxi across London because I can't lift up the case. No books go back with me. You keep whatever left. And uh, I'm here. Why? This is a God moment. I got 100,000 people backing me and I just believe there's somebody here that's going to make a very serious decision tonight about your future. Maybe it's missions. Maybe it's ministry in this country. Maybe it's in some other area that only you and your personal communion with God would understand. But I know this is a destiny meeting. This is a destiny moment for someone because I have so many people praying. And I have this now 57 years of experiencing Jesus' grace. And if that can happen... A character like I'm not a natural Christian. I still have lots of struggles. I don't, I'm not this great person of faith some people think I am. Some days, like I said, it's just survival. I'm sort of still a doubting Thomas. I still have intellectual problems with certain things, especially in the Old Testament, that I've never been able to figure out. 
I still have to be very careful. Women are just so attractive. I don't understand why God hasn't taken away. Now just saying that, somebody will probably want to come up and cast on a demon. I've already had that. But, uh, you know, even when I was there in India, uh, these women, these Indian women are so beautiful and their little saris and smile. I just wanted to kiss one. I wouldn't do anything. I just want to, like, kiss and run. That would have got me in big trouble. So, hallelujah, I never did it. His grace is sufficient. His strength is made perfect in weakness. But as Christians, no matter how filled we are with the Holy Spirit, we're still human. We're still susceptible. And Satan doesn't give up. In fact, he specializes in old people because if they've had a good testimony their whole life, he's very angry by that. He wants to ruin at the end. You want to know how many men of God have been ruined in their final couple of years? I mean, it's unreal. Even founders of organizations, praise God, the leaders of OM, they were already worried about me. What am I going to do when I get older? I'll do something really, really bizarre so they have a special accountability group. All they do is watch George Burr, you know, moment by moment, t- emails, texts, how you doing? You're okay? You getting enough rest? You know, do you love your wife? You know, it's like living a, living a goldfish bowl. Well, we need accountability, but uh, I think sometimes they may be overdoing it. But Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We hold the shield of faith with which we stop the fiery darts of the evil one. So let's pray for workers to go into the harvest field. There's about 40 nations that would have less than 1% of what we have. We long for more workers here. We long for more to happen here. What are we going to say about those 40 countries? I won't give you my 40 list, but I'll just give you the top 10. North Korea, Tibet. Afghanistan, Iraq and Iran, Saudi Arabia, Yemen, including Socotra, where there's not a single believer, Libya, Tunisia, Turkmenistan. All 10 of those countries have just hardly anything. Actually, North Korea has more than most, but it's on my top 10 because the level of suffering and extreme is just so great in North Korea. And when you pray your way through this book, in many ways, people have told me this, you'll never be the same. Your your vision for the nations will become more like the vision that God himself has. And then our final passage is on Isaiah chapter 6. This great worship passage where we find Isaiah just worshiping the Lord and having this experience with the living God, which I'm sure uh, all of us hopefully have had in one way or the other. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and exalted, seated on a throne. The train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphim, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces. With two they covered their feet. With two they were flying. And they were calling, they were calling one to another. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. Isn't that powerful? At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and the threshold shook. And the temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me. This is his response. This man of God, this prophet of God, this is his response to to the worship, to the greatness of God, the omnipresence, the omniscience of God. At the sound of the voices, the doorposts and the threshold shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. And he says, Woe, woe to me, I cried. I'm ruined. For I'm a, I'm a man of unclean lips. I live among a people of unclean lips. Mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. I don't know how many hundreds of times I've read that passage. I've often, often, you know, sinned with the tongue. I don't know if, I'm sure he's not referring only to that. But I know in my life, the tongue seemed to be the hardest thing. And here I was, a Christian leader, winning people to Christ. And yet in my home with my own wife, I'd say unkind things and hurt her. My wife came from a very rough background. Her father was killed in the war. She's in an orphanage. Her stepfather, a total avid anti-Christian, abused her, uh, verbally threw her out of the home. In God's providence, I would have never met her. And uh, even when I met her, she just seemed to have so many areas of difficulty, though I was... I'd been fasting, no girls, no kissing. I had so much chaos after I became a Christian. I'd lead a girl to Christ and then kiss her for an hour. That's not in the follow-up books. And, you know, 
God had to really just, just break me. And so I was actually on a two-year fast. No kissing, no girls, no dating. That's when I left university and went to Moody Bible Institute. Wow, what an experience. You arrive there at a Bible Institute. All the girls are born again. And yet a lot of them are really attractive. So I was infatuated with about six girls in the first week, crying out for mercy. Of course, a lot of them carried big Bibles. You try to kiss one of those, it hit you with an authorized version. It might never recover, so I didn't kiss any of them. And I just, evangelism, study, prayer, just gung-ho for Jesus. And I went to rent a, an evangelistic film. And there was a woman in charge of the films that changed my life. It was too much. I just saw her. My romantic circuits went on overload and blew. I broke my fast, moved in on the target, <laughs> said something completely stupid to her. Uh, for me, it was love at first sight or whatever. For her, it was fright at first sight. <laughs> she was a little quiet girl from Iowa, and this loudmouth type extrovert from New Jersey. It was too much. But I managed to get her on that first date. It was like an interrogation. And I said, look, probably nothing going to happen between you and me. But, you know, hint, hint. Um, you know, if you ever married me, you needed to know that I'm going to be a missionary. And you'll probably end up being eaten alive by cannibals in New Guinea. I actually said that. You know, later someone counseled me, the Graham Jack type, came and counseled me that, you know, that's not really the best way to win a woman's heart. But God had another plan. She was still not really that interested. And I mobilized my prayer warriors. And God broke her heart. She began to think I was a man of God because people were talking about what was happening in Mexico through a ministry. Then she started to believe I was a Bible teacher. I think she heard me preach maybe once. And so I took her right to Ephesians 5, not the whole chapter. It's a key verse. Submit unto your husbands as unto the Lord. What do you think of that? And she sort of agreed, and so pretty soon uh, I asked her to marry me, and she said, yes, whoa. Typical Bible college marriage. We didn't really know each other. Uh, I, of course, didn't believe in any honeymoon, didn't believe in spending money except for world missions, and got her to sell all of her possessions, to put the money, most of them, to world missions. Didn't believe in a honeymoon, that would cost money. Didn't believe in renting an apartment. We just lived on the floor, the back of the bookstore, and praise God, the marriage went really great. Uh, for several weeks. <laughs> and then she uh, started reading the other verses. <laughs> but God had done something before that wedding. God had met her in her room. She had three illnesses that were all linked more with the emotional, spiritual side. Not all, well, not all illnesses the same. Surely you know that. But this is very much linked with her childhood hurt and uh, lack of love in her family. And it was being escalated because I wasn't on a human level so busy. We went to Mexico City together. I was at university trying to reach a million people with the gospel, leading the team. I didn't have much time for my fiancée. She ended up in a room crying. And I only found this out later on. But just to make a long story short, she discovered from the word of God this great truth of the all-sufficiency of Jesus. And for the first time, she somehow just cast herself upon Jesus, you know. I love you, meet my deepest needs, with or without marriage, with or without this or that, you know, all the other things we feel are necessary for us to be somehow happy. She fell asleep that night and woke up healed of those three illnesses. And I think that's why recently we celebrated 52 years of tremendous marriage together in total faithfulness to one another by the grace and the power of the living Jesus. Anyway, I don't know how I got into that, looking here at Isaiah chapter 6, except, woe is me, a man of unclean lips, among a people of unclean lips. And I just thank God for radical forgiveness. And I thank the Lord also for a wife, who when I failed, somehow she forgave me, and somehow even affirmed me, and encouraged me in the ministry. Often traveling with me for many years, not so much. Uh, recently. What a great passage. But we want to just bring this to a close. As we see Isaiah's response, we see this experience of cleansing. It's sort of like the kind of renewal that came to my wife. Verse 6. One of the seraphim flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. 
With it, he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away. Your sin atoned for. How many times have you read something like that in the Old Testament? That is amazing. You think you suddenly jumped into the book of Romans. I'm still trying to, you know, fit that all together. But it, it, it's this tremendous shout. Our God is a God who forgives. And sometimes I find Christians are so sensitive about their sin. And that's good. But they have to be equally sensitive about God's forgiveness. If it's gone, it's gone. Maybe you've had a lot of failure in your life. Maybe you're no longer on plan B. Maybe you're on plan H. Praise God for a big alphabet. Press on <laughs> in the grace that's in the Lord Jesus. Satan is the accuser of the brethren. Especially, and I do a lot of counseling with people with sexual complexities, especially pornography, because I had that struggle, and I still have to be careful. But I find young men, and I think women even more, I don't get involved in counseling women much, but uh, I believe when we fail in that area, the guilt and the pain is ten times greater. Like People don't seem to be so uptight when they sin with their tongue, a little gossip, or when they're impatient. The greatest... Command is to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, to love your neighbor as yourself. Most people seem to be able to take it pretty easy when they fail in those two areas, even though the Bible teaches that's huge. But again, it's an example. No matter how filled we are with the Spirit, we're incredibly human. And our society dictates certain things. And so sexual sin is wiping out a lot of young men. Because getting victory over pornography today is five times greater than in my day. It's just there. It's, it's in your phone. It's in a computer. Uh, they've taken massive research. Even a very high percentage of missionaries on the field are struggling with pornography. doesn't mean they're addicted, but it means, you know, the battle is going on. And I just thank the Lord for radical forgiveness. Because as a Christian, I also failed a number of times with my eyes looking and lusting. Once a magazine even in, hanging in a tree in the woods. I just know. The reality, my guilt is taken away. Jesus forgives. Jesus paid it all. And when God looks at us, he sees somehow the blood of Christ. He sees somehow the beauty of Jesus. It's because Isaiah had this great experience that he was able to discern more God's will. It really is a real struggle to me when I meet young people they want God's blessing in their studies. They want God's blessing in a lot of different areas. They want God to answer their prayer. And yet they've never embraced the Lordship of Jesus. So they wonder why sometimes they're not getting very far in their Christian life. We have to embrace his Lordship. That's a process. It's a crisis and a process. process. Our time, our money, our future, our emotions... That romance factor, that fear factor, that worry factor. And I believe this message of forgiveness is a message a lot of people need today. You know, people are coming to Jesus here in Britain. Come to Jesus in, in prisons. I just heard the testimony of a converted gangster just a few nights ago. I mean, it was just unreal what God did in this totally depraved, evil, evil person. Of course, in prison for his crime. And now he's sharing Jesus. I was recently with Nick Gumbel, the leader of the Alpha Course. It's phenomenal. They expect to fill the Royal Albert Hall in their next leadership conference. They got similar conferences all over the world. Why? Because people are coming to Jesus. Now in some of the places we're working, like Turkey, Afghanistan, uh, a number of countries, we're not seeing that. But we're hanging in there. But we are seeing it here in this country, not to the level we're dreaming, maybe not to the same level it was, you know, when Spurgeon was preaching in London. I don't know, I wasn't there. I know he was a human being with lots of struggles as well. And I just believe every one of us should be able to pray this same prayer that Isaiah prayed after the experience he had of worship and cleansing. Verse 8, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? Who will go for us? And I said, here am I, send me. Isn't that a great prayer? Here am I, send me. And he said, go and tell this people. 
and ever hearing, but never understand. Well, he had a tough task. Some of our people in the Muslim world face things similar to that. And sometimes here, we share and they don't understand. Nothing happens. We get discouraged. But we have to be obedient to Jesus. How many of you have already prayed that prayer? Just think back. You've been to a missions meeting. You've already had Isaiah 6 punched at you years ago. And you prayed that prayer. The preacher said, look, let's pray that prayer. Stand up and pray that prayer. That's what I'm going to do in a few minutes, so I warned you. How many have already prayed that prayer? Raise your hand. Okay, we got about, we got about a 20% being optimistic. So this is a great opportunity for the rest of you. I'm going to ask as we close for you to pray that prayer. But I need to explain. It used to be a lot of times when people were challenged to pray this prayer, it was just to be a missionary. For, I did it. It gets results. You know, God has a sense of humor. It's not really a fair treatment of the passage. Pulling it out of context, in the middle of the Old Testament. And so I've taken a more generic approach. And I really believe this. I preach this all over the world. Every believer can pray this prayer. Because every believer, unless they really are rebellious, every believer wants God's will. And so we can pray, Lord, here am I. Send me. I preached in a big Korean church in Sydney, Australia. And this, I took the whole hour on that one passage. And uh, before I went into the passage, I just pointed out that prayer and said, how many have already prayed that prayer? I thought a lot of hands would go up because Koreans are pretty active in missions. Only a few hands went up. After looking at this passage for one hour and explaining my particular way of seeing this, I said, how many will stand and pray that prayer? And I think 90% of the congregation stood and prayed, here am I. Send me. It's a prayer of availability. And I want to ask you tonight, and don't take this step of faith if it's not real. Are you available? What if the Lord suddenly gives you a better job with three times as much pay in the East End? Are you available? Well, for three, much, yeah, for three times as much pay, maybe the East End would attract me. It's amazing what the Lord's people will do when they get a bigger salary somewhere. <laughs> of course, in America, we lead the way. You're pastoring a small church like this. I spot you. <laughs> I just offer you 20% raise and the church watches the dust as you blow out of town. I could write a book about it. <laughs> Praise God. I find the British people a little more sane, actually, than the average American. And that's why I've decided to stay here the rest of my life. But I have to be available. Well, if he sends me back to the United States, please, Jesus, you know, have mercy. Have mercy, Lord. Lord. You know, India, China, Mongolia, regions beyond, but not back to America. And I don't have anything against America. <clears throat> Everybody can pray this prayer. Here am I. Send me. It's a prayer of availability. It has to be in the awareness of grace. God is not going to thrust you into something and not give you the grace to do it. God is not going to run roughshod over your present situation, your present responsibilities. And so in most cases, when you pray, here am I, send me, the Lord will just touch your heart and say, I've already sent you. I put you in Bury St. Edmunds, at least for this season in your life. I put you in this particular church just for this season in your life. One man actually told me that after he prayed the prayer, God just touched his heart and said, you're where I want you. Bloom where you are. Completely changed his attitude toward his work. He had a really bad attitude toward his job. Anybody here like that this evening? Really bad attitude toward your job. When he went to work the next day, Monday, completely different view. This is my mission field. This is where God's put me for now. Maybe he'll lead me somewhere later on. I'm not going to live in some little dream world. I'm going to bloom where I am in this job, in this particular time in my life, with these responsibilities I have toward my children, toward my family, toward my community. And he was one much happier disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's be real. God 
works through circumstances, through providence. Maybe living in this town, in this time, wasn't your first choice. My friend Viv Thomas has written a whole book about the so-called first choice world. Most of the people in the Bible didn't really seem to be in their first choice world. We were the first group in missions to recruit divorced people, unheard of in the late 50s. All divorced people, in my view, were persecuted by the church. Even if the divorce was years before they ever even heard the gospel, they were still second-class citizens. They couldn't do this, they couldn't do that, certainly can't go to the mission field. I look back at 50 years working with divorced, even divorced remarried people, and I've seen God use them in powerful ways on our ships and all over the world. You say, well, that doesn't fit into our box here. You know, God is not into boxes. We can't put God in a box. God forgives. God restores. God gives people a whole new way of life, even sometimes when they're past 50, past 60 years. Some are testifying the best years of their life were between 75 and 85. Give God all the glory. I'm not even there yet. Look what I have ahead of me. Brothers and sisters, I'd ask you as we close, please pray this prayer. Follow in the steps of many others, especially Isaiah, and say, Lord, here am I. Send me. It might only be across the street. It might be just an affirmation he's already sent you. But you're just telling Jesus you love him, you want his lordship, you're available. Let's pray.